So welcome back. Now I would like to introduce you to the moderator of today's panel, Carol Becker. Carol Becker is Professor of the Arts and Dean of Columbia University of the Arts. She has published numerous articles and books on cultural criticism and the role of artists in society. Her most recent books are Thinking in Plays, Art, Action, and Cultural Production, and her memoir, Losing Helen, an Essay. Thank you, Carol, for accepting to moderate today's discussion and have a great panel. Thank you so much, Jean-Baptiste. I'm really pleased to be part of this Banksico Festival. I have been very proud to be involved with Cambodian Living Arts since I first met Plun Prim and others in New York when they were organizing the remarkable season of Cambodia Festival in New York in 2013. So it's really my pleasure to continue to be involved with this amazing group of people and introdu to introduce you to three of the artists who created original new works for the festival and who will be in conversation with me for our panel on art, healing, hope, and creative resilience. I would first like to introduce a panel, the panelists uh, and then we will engage in conversation. I'd also like to say that um, one great mark of a really important work of art is that it keeps generating more art. And that is definitely true of Banksicole, that it has engaged these three amazing uh, young artists in, in reiterations of its message. So let me introduce to you Tromvan Sodachivi, or Belle. She is a dancer and choreographer with Amrita Performing Arts, a contemporary dance and producing organization from Cambodia. She was trained in Cambodian classical dance and studied at the Royal University of Fine Arts, where she is currently on the Faculty of Choreographic Arts. She has participated in numerous contemporary dance workshops and residencies around the world and has worked with fantastic directors such as Peter Sellers and others. And she brings together the East and the West, the classical and the contemporary in new forms of choreography and dance. Hello, Carol, thank you. Next is Vivian Fong. She is a Juno award-winning composer born in Canada and educated at Juilliard. She has studied the music and histories of many cultures, blending Western musical forms with those of minority regions of China, North Vietnam, Bali, Indonesia, and so forth. She combines idiosyncratic textures and styles into large scale works that reflect her own multicultural background. She has a very big global career as a composer. She's won many awards. She's a teacher and a mentor to the next generation and is recognized as one of the most interesting composers working today. Hello, Carol. David Lok K. Wan is an active performer and composer based in Singapore. He is an artist fellow at Yang Sito Conservatory of Music, which is a school of the National University of Singapore and Singapore's first conservatory of music. He studied there and also at Yale School of Music. The orchestra from the Yang Sito Conservatory was the first regional orchestra to play excerpts from Bang Sokol and has been involved from the beginning of the project. David Loke is also an active member of the musical group, The Lorong Boys. He too works in multiple forms and is a classical and jazz composer and musician. And all three, as you can see, share many things in common, including the bringing together of the East and the West, their role as educators, their interests in culture, and their amazing creativity. So I would like to just ask each of you, and we can start with, um, with David, how did you, how did you first become involved with Banks of Coal? And in the, same, in the same vein, while you're speaking about that, maybe how did you choose or how did you think about creating a new response to Banks of Coal? So we'll start with David with that question. Um, and I can repeat the question for everybody if it gets confusing. Well, I was working uh, at, I, I still work at uh, Young Street Conservatory of Music where we, uh, sent over uh, musicians as part of you know this outreach program and everything so that we collaborated with Cambodian Living Arts to help them put on a 
showcase and their performance of Bang Sokao last year. And this year, because of the pandemic, we weren't able to travel down and, you know, all the borders shut down. So this time round, we decided, uh, well, Cambodian Living Arts decided that they would like to reach out to all the former groups that have contributed and that have been involved and to see who would like to, you know, be a part of their online performance this year. And so uh, our school decided that, hey, you know, we would like to be a part of that. And so what we did was we took one of the previous, uh, one of the existing works that we performed last year, and we just kind of uh, performed like half of it. And then after that, I rearranged the second half to kind of go into a direction that is a bit more, um, you know, it, there was some a bit more like what we, the, the orchestra over here would be used to playing. So yeah, that's what it is. And Vivian? How did you how did you get involved in all this to begin with? So my involvement um, comes through the Metropolis Ensemble and Andrew Sear, and I believe the Metropolis premiered um, and gave performances all around the world of Bangsakol, and they're the Western Orchestra that's associated with the production. And um, Andrew and I uh, have a long history together. Um, we have known each other 10 plus years and he actually uh, was the director and conductor of my Juno Award winning album with my uh, piano concerto and violin concerto. Um, so we've been doing a lot of work together and he knew about, uh, we've been keeping in touch um, even though I have moved to California and he's still in New York. Um, and I also went to Cal uh, Cambodia for the first time last year. And the reason for me going, not just for touristic reasons, is because uh, of my family history. We are Chinese and, and Chinese uh, ancestry. And although I was born in Canada, my, um, my uncle, um, so my mother's uh, older brother, actually lived uh, in Phnom Penh with his whole family. Uh, right when, at the time uh, in the 1970s when uh, I was born in 1975. And they actually um, were there with the whole purge uh, of Phnom Penh. And uh, they, it was miraculous that the entire family, uh, my aunt and uncle and a whole bunch of relatives um, escaped the whole Khmer Rouge regime. So I was born during those circumstances and um, I've always wanted to uh, understand more about my family history, especially as it reflects my childhood as well. And so, uh, you know, since I'm uh, of a certain age, I can look back. Um, I think it's time for me to um, really uh, reflect on that and also um, uh, have a, an artistic sort of uh, that that I can uh, generate some artistic input uh, uh, from from that. So Monsacol really is uh, it it really touches my you know core being as far as um, uh, my family history and my um, attempts to understand uh, what went on. Elle, can you tell us? How did you, you've been involved from the very beginning, I know. How did you first get involved with Bang Uh As I remember, the first time when I involved with Bang School uh, was uh, the time that Bang School come to uh, do the process and then working for the create performance because they already create the music and the film. So on that time, uh, Sila A come to us on the top performing art that I'm working for as a one translator, but could be the the person that understand about art, about dancing history uh, very well. So to working and translate for Gideon that uh, is a director working for the performance. So my involved on that time just only five days because uh, they need me only five days to translate and then uh, assistant or director in, uh, in Phnom Penh while they are doing the research and then uh, explore the performance. So the first day that I come and then uh, do the rehearsal, it's, it's uh, you know, it's uh, exciting, but on the same time, I'm very shocked because I see the film that uh, Lopu the Pipan 
research and then some other document film I never seen before. Even I'm living in Cambodia, I'm a Cambodian, but uh, normally they put the document film on the TV, but it's uh, different from the one that the uh, Lopuda Tipan uh, put uh, in the bank school. It's uh, very shocking, but on the same time also, you know, it's uh, make me feel more understand about my parents, my uh, aunt or another old generation that uh, they have been shocked during the Pol Pot regime. Some people, they don't want to talking about that. So my generation, uh, still some of us, we not really uh, know much about uh, Pol Pot regime. But for me, I'm hurt a little bit from my mom because sometimes she's very silent. She cry when she hear the frog, frog crying, and then her tears also come down because she missed a lot of uh, their parents because uh, they passed away during both body gym and also my mom uh, kid. So that is the first time that I'm involved with the bank school. After that more, uh, I think Gideon and then Cambodian Living Art really uh, like and would love me to enjoy more, continue with the project. So after that, they went to uh, explore and then the final rehearsal together with the music, the film, and then the, the performer in uh, Taiwan. So I involved again. And then during on that time, I became an artist that uh, performed in the bank school also because uh, in the state design, we have uh, the, a lot of stone from the Buddha to the Lanka. So the stone had to prepare during the performance. And uh, first time, Lopu Ratipan, Gideon, and then uh, Dr. Hansapi would love uh, a kid to do that, but the kid is to uh, take more time. So for me as a dancer and also I'm a Cambodian, so I could understand and then uh, very easy to do that with uh, you know, the spiritual concentrate and understand the sequence of the bank school, what it mean. Yeah, meditate and very calm. So after that, I become artist and a choreographer for the dancing in the bank school piece. So this really, is to any of you who wants to answer, what is most inspiring to you um, from this production? You know, you but you were asked to do something new, but what from where did you take the inspiration? Like, what is it that moves you as artists about Banks Cole? The idea behind it, I think, is quite um, profound. Um, that you have survivors of, of the Khmer Rouge um, coming together uh, to form this production. And I was very curious to, you know, to see what um, the artistic uh, reaction of uh, that is. And I, I was very, um, I don't know, viewing it, it was quite profound to me that um, it seems like the composer uh, has really come to peace with what happened. And, um, you know, it's very uh, Buddhist maybe, uh, and very uh, spiritual. Uh, but I was really um, quite taken aback that um, he, he was at peace with what happened. And I don't know that uh, if I survived something like that, that uh, it would uh, have such a, um, sort of a calm outcome. And I, I found that quite touching. So did it, did it affect you when you were writing your music? Well, I think um, my music was more a reaction to the end piece that the sort of the jubilation at the end. And I wanted to uh, just have a riff on that. I mean, I, I come from a background where I played in the Balinese gamelan for a long time. And I took that and sort of reflected it in some sort of virtuosic way. So for me, it was a, a um, sort of a play on the energy of, of the last scene. And um, it was really something that was clangorous. And it was really interesting that um, Viti Pan took that as something maybe more uh, macabre and, and, and thought of it in, in his uh, footage with, with the um, with the, the mo montage of, of death and, and dying. So I thought that was quite interesting that he had that reaction. 
David, anything about the, I mean, where the, what inspired you? I mean, artists always, there's something, you know, that you grab onto, so. Sure, um, I would say that for me, the, the, the thing that about the whole situation that struck me is, um, because Cambodia, for me, I, I'm from Singapore, so Cambodia is a lot closer to home. And growing up, um, when you hear about like the great, um, the, 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 the tragedies that happen, Cambodia is often not as talked about as that, say, uh, the Holocaust in World War II, even though that, you know, to, even, even though that took place a longer time ago, and it was like so much further away, but like that gets most of the media attention. And, um, uh, and you know, this, this, uh, this, this thing is relatively recent. Uh, and it, it, like you can still feel the effects like today when you go into Cambodia and you and you and you and you and you see like oh my gosh like this is like honestly as recent when you go and see like the killing fields in the building so to me that's the thing that's really really strikes me the most the 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 music that we did to try and uh, do justice to we did our best to um, respect the composer him Sophie as much of his original work as possible and after that it was just more about uh, the reason why we changed up the last part was also because we wanted to be like, well, it's different from being there. And so it would, we wanted it to sound a bit more like Western and, uh, you know, because that's uh, our identity as a music conservatory is, yes, we are still in incorporating elements of folk, of local music, uh, which is, you know, brings out the Asian-ness in people and, you know, uh, cultural pride and everything. But also that is also what uh, strings like the western string orchestra would be more uh it's more canon i guess it's more yeah so that that's what the later half would be it was to also you know play something that fits more a bit with the western canon and like that fits the vibe of uh the western string instruments and also that signifies that you know we we are part we're not in cambodia right now even though we really want to mm. be yeah sort of locating yourself and your yeah. own entities within this very powerful, powerfully rooted Cambodian experience. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense to me. May, may well, I, you're, go ahead. Uh, may I add just a reaction to both David and Bell's statements? Um, Please. You know, because, because I live in the US, um, you know, uh, what David just said about, you know, people don't know as much about what happened, I think in the US, I mean, a lot of people don't even know where Cambodia is and, uh, and, and not, not, you know, about the genocide, I think, you know, I think it's still um, something that is uh, not really talked about. And especially now with what happened, you know, in recent years and the international tribute, uh, you know, the, the, the courts and, and, and what, what was happening, um, and the fact that you know justice has only you know become part of the language in Cambodia and, and, and the fact that Bell doesn't wasn't really um, you know familiar with with with, with some Zimit. of the things that happened I think it's really important what Cambodia Living Arts has done to really and also Him Supi and, and also Riti Pan especially Riti Pan to really um, bring to light what has happened. And I think that's the power of the arts is that um, we can really um, open the eyes of people to see that this has, this has really happened in, in Cambodia and that we, we, we can't forget about it because if we forget about it and, and we don't know about it, then it's likely to happen again. It's really beautifully said. Um, Bell. Do you want to, you, you spoke so um, powerfully about the way in which Banks Co. opened, showed you things that you had not seen. What, um, what in it inspires you as an artist? Yeah, uh, first I would love to say I agree with uh, Vivian about that because uh, the history for us is uh, very important. So let us to understand very clear our background and continue and then uh, don't want the history repeat again to the genocide or whatever. So first time that uh, uh, I heard when they said, okay, 
but you will involve with the bank school opera. So for me, because we understand bank school, what it means in Cambodia, bank school is a one uh, ceremony that uh, we do at the pagoda only for the, you know, uh, for the dead people that uh, already passed away. So we give offering to the monk, the monk will chanting to give that uh, wish. But uh, when they said the uh, monk school as an opera, it's uh, already strange and weird for me. And But it's made me very interesting. How could monk school as a body ceremony to become an art and perform on the stage? And then more and more it's uh, open also like uh, uh, international stage. So for me as an artist, I really uh, interesting. I, I really want to involve. So when I involve it, I understand that Bang School have a, a document film that the show by uh, Lupu the Tipan and also compose some music. It's a uh, it's very new for Cambodian people because normally we don't use the chanting when the monk chanting to create like a song. But in the piece of, of Bang School, Dr. Hans P used the chanting become opera singing and also play combining with the Western instrument. So this is amazing for us as a, a Cambodian audience or people. And on the same time, uh, perspective of the, I mean, Sila, uh, I have been uh, bring it's a, uh, it's a uh, very important for us. We're talking about uh, the dark history, but the way that uh, we are showing it's a uh, use art as a tool to, to remind the people, to, to make the people, let's say, cry out, but on the same time to make people also calm down and release all the darkness inside their mind. So as a Cambodian, uh, you know, it's like, uh, we have to study and understand our background, our history. I know that the uh, genocide, uh, it's not happened only in Cambodia. It's uh, a lot in another country also about uh, people killing people, the same uh, nationality because, uh, yeah, so many things happen. But uh, this is a, a, a very bad lesson or let's say is uh, the thing that we should know very well and very clear to protect in the future not happen again like that. Yeah. You, you've said, you've all said some really important things. Um, one is a complicated idea actually, which is to take religious or spiritual rituals that and move them into a different context and to use art as a kind of alchemy to transform them into something else that, and then Bell, you just said it too, and Vivian, you said it too. It, it is, it's something so particular to Cambodia, but it's something universal to genocide, to human suffering, to things that we do, that we harm each other as humans and that we continue to do it. It's not something, that what happened once, as David said, it's not not just World War II, but it's replicating and replicating and happening as we speak in Africa, you know, right now. So, so Bella, I want to ask you, given that context of all the things, can you talk about this new ritual that you created for this virtual event? Um, can you talk about how you thought about that, because that's a continuation of this idea to take to make take something so close to Cambodian culture and give it, you know, give it to the world in a way. Here, say, you can be part of this. Yeah, uh, thank you. So talking about the spiritual dance that I created uh, in the seven minutes, the music is apart from the bank school from the beginning. It's uh, also very special to my personal because as a Cambodian dancer, when uh, we uh, do perform Cambodian classical dance, the spiritual and then the, the end center that always stay behind us. So normally we always respect it before we start dancing, but we never show the dance on the stage. When we show dance on the stage, it's uh, another character. But this time as a, a dancer, but I show you know something that stay behind my mind, my background as a, a real that we can see in life 
to perform for the audience. That is the first one. And the second one, uh, the spiritual dance that we create, we want to uh, share to the people in Cambodia or around the world that uh, art can release and then can heal you by uh, listen, by watching, open your heart, open your mind, open your body to, to accept and to forgive by uh, the art. So, yeah. <laughs> you all say these things so matter of factly, but they're very, very big ideas, I promise you. Um, because what you're talking about is how do you transform culture? How do you transform history? How do you heal a collective? And how do you take rituals who, that are used to heal a collective and move them into a global context? That those are, those are big things to think about as, as creative people. Um, and I think it's partly why I've always been so interested in Van Sokol. Everything that you've all said is why I've been so drawn to it because all of that is there. Um, so, so talk to me a little bit about anyone who would like about, you all do something where you move between the classical and the contemporary, like you're, and you, you, you do it quite fluidly. So I'm just curious how you think about it if you think about it, or it just, just comes so naturally, generationally to you to do it. But it's the way you use instruments or the way you use sound or the way you, that you just, there seem to be no borders. Like you're all classically trained, but you're also able to move into the present very, and integrate them and distill them and create something completely new as a result. So anyone want to talk about how you, if you think about it, how you think about it? Um, I, I mean, I, I would just think that for like most artists, uh, when you, because like our art form is like what we kind of dedicate our entire life to, you know, doing. So you, you, you do spend some thought about it, but you just, at the end of the day, that's just what you are doing every single day. So yeah, I'm sorry if that's not a real answer, but. No, it's, yeah. it's it, what it, it, it is an answer because what you're saying is in a way it comes quite naturally to you to be moving forward. Yeah, know? I guess. And um, I think also at the same time, it's not just about, um, I know there's a lot of uh, talk and conversation about how, you know, like artists have to stay relevant and, you know, what they, uh, like they try and reinvent themselves all the time. But if we look at um, art and like the history of the great art, uh, you know, that we try to emulate. And it's a lot of art, it's a very reactive thing, you know, whether it's um, uh, you're reacting from a certain emotion that you feel or whether it's from another form of art or from like something like a certain gross injustice that you see. So like, let, let's take, for example, like the music itself and like the, the work of Debussy and uh, Ravel when they go into this kind of quasi uh, impressionistic period they they were looking at the works of Monet and you know what they were like and, and seeing it the way he was painting and they were like oh, okay maybe we can do the same thing with sonic uh, landscapes I'm sorry I, I wasn't there in France so I, I can't say for with historical certainty that that was what was going through their mind but um, th this is just me extrapolating I might be totally wrong and um, we think about something that let's say in in the US with um I'm sorry, I forgot the author, but who wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin? Who, Can you know, I like, you know? Mm -hmm. yes, yes, thank you. Uh, and, and she, and she like felt these like great injustices between like the racial divide. And, you know, so she decides to write a story that like resonates with so many people and actually like sparks the whole movement. So, and so that's, I mean, you can say like these, like how do they come up with these things? But it's also a very reactive thing where you see something and you, and you feel something and you try and, um, just contribute as much as you can and hopefully it can make a positive impact. Yeah. So, um, so I, gu I guess I can answer both of your questions. Um, I guess I see myself uh, more as a humanist uh, that works in the medium of uh, sound and music. So, you know, as an artist, you're trying to um, give some sort of uh, sort of something that can't be articulated verbally and you're trying to give voice to that in, in music. 
And that can be very powerful. And to me, it is powerful. And to me, when I go through the creative process, it also becomes something spiritual as well, because it's not about you. And so that power of um, the, the potential to um, take someone out of who they are and uh, what they know uh, and uh, put them into a situation that is entirely new or that uh, they don't know anything about and then to live that through that situation I think is quite far powerful for the arts and you know uh, that's what I mean by being a humanist and and music and sound is only the vehicle that I am trained in and and, and have um, you know uh, background in and that is how I can I choose to communicate um, that a power of expression and so it becomes it's not just music but it becomes something quite powerful and quite necessary I think you know we always try to justify the value of arts um, and there's no time like the present to be able to um, get away from what we know and you know get away from the divisiveness of now you know and 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 to really um, understand a perspective that we are not familiar with I think that is a, a great power for the arts. Bill do you want to add anything to all that? Yes just a, a bit very short because uh, here um, because my background from the classical dance and then I moved to contemporary dance, it's a take a year or so. And on the same time, what I've been noted for myself, it's a Cambodian classical dance, it's a more about uh, Khmer or Cambodian identity to present uh, for the human, for the society or show the world of Cambodian. But for contemporary dance, somehow I can find more about myself, who I am as a, a you know, a woman or as a people or as an artist to connect with my life. But also on the same time, it's like, you know, uh, identity, myself in the future, they are, it's uh, around. So contemporary then somehow open my mind, open uh, also the ability and confidence as a, a woman in Cambodia to stand up, to do something, to create. So that it's uh, incorrect me a lot. Was that difficult to do? I mean, classical dance is very acceptable, but if you move into another form, was there resistance for you? Were people, I mean, did people accept you uh, in working in these other ways? From the beginning, no. So yeah, we, yeah it's uh, when Amrita created around uh, 2004, it's so uh, very difficult. And uh, yeah, take like almost 10 years to 15 years until right now, two years ago, the government started open the door for contemporary dance. And I also start teaching contemporary dance class in a university, but not, not the, the big course yet, just only uh, the private or someone interesting. But yeah, in the beginning, all my master, all the people, they don't understand what is contemporary dance. And then why we have to do that? Because in Cambodia, we have uh, like uh, 20 more than an uh, art form. Some art form we not yet uh, find it, we lose it during the war. And then uh, they complain a lot because uh, we, they don't understand what is contemporary then mean. But we try our best to continue because uh, we know this is what we want for the future. Because uh, when we go to the future, normally I always tell myself, whatever I do contemporary then go to the future, but I still know the way to go back home. I don't lose my identity. So the, those things, it's a connect, you know, it's a round. You know, what Vivian, what, what you were saying, um, it's, it, right now, there's a lot of interest in what artists are able to do because it's become very clear finally to people that it's difficult for people um, to communi communicate with each other in the society, that we're, we have all of these barriers to how we're able to talk to each other. And what people realize is that we need the arts to 
a, uh, to go deep inside of people's human emotions so that we can find each other in this deeper place, which is human, which is what you were saying, I think, in this notion of humanism that, uh, and that, so maybe we can talk about what the role of the artist is now, as you see it. Um, how do you, and, and it doesn't even have to be that you see yourself that way, you know, because sometimes people are resistant to think, well, I, this big idea about who I am, but, but more about what, what, given the way the world is, given the polarizations of the world, how, how do you think artists can, can, fun, can function in that, you know? What role can they play? There's a lot of um, emotions, uh, especially now. Um, and that can be, uh, you know, due to, you know, our circumstances with COVID and politically what's happening all across the world. Um, and there's a lot of emotions that can't be articulated or um, that it's, you know, wells up inside you, you know, anger or frustration or sadness or, or fear. Um, and I think the arts um, is, is really a great outlet for people to explore what it is that they're, they're going through. And a lot of times the deepest emotions are those that you can't articulate because they, they, run, they run deep. And somehow the arts um, latches itself to that, you know, that place and gives form to something that is formless. Um, you know, I, I composed right when the shutdown happened, um, I was commissioned to compose for a virtual orchestra uh, from the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. And so I chose to write a piece called Prayer because I wanted um, to reflect that music can have the power to heal. Um, and, and so, you know, it is something I think transformative and something quite impactful. And it really is, is so a beacon to us, for me, uh, to me, uh, that, that can guide us through these difficult times. David, any thoughts on this? Um, oh yeah, a lot. Um, but <laughs> I, I, I think I, 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 I can't speak for every single artist out there, but I, I really, really agree with, uh, you know, what Vivian said. Um, but as for like myself as an artist, like on a probably a more smaller scale, I, I just think that um, it is, I guess it's our role and our job to just try and make, you know, especially now that let's say like uh, in the pandemic times when, you know, uh, our opportunities to go out and to travel about have been cut down. It's like, what do people turn to when they need a distraction? And so that's when, you know, you turn to your films and your books and your cons co consume of, you know, uh, consumation of content. And so for, for us, that would be like our time as artists to, okay, well, to, to spread joy and to, you know, spread love or whether if it is like a, a sad emotion that we are feeling is to, to try and express that so that someone out there can also experience that with you or, if they're looking for a way to pass their time meaningfully without thinking of, you know, their work, then we just try our best. But that's more at a more micro level and not at like the big human stage. The, yeah. Sounds big to me, actually. It sounds very big to me. <laughs> okay, cool, yeah. <laughs> Belle, how do you think about the role of artists? I think, you know, as myself and then have been a talk to uh, some artists that uh, we have a uh, different uh, situation for now. Uh, whatever we have uh, to change and whatever we have to uh, to uh, to revert because uh, of the situation COVID-19. Um, but we are all as artists, we are still a uh, struggle and then a uh, passion try to uh, focus more on our skill to create somehow that we can. Example like uh, my team during this time, I mean artists, they are separate and some of them they are very uh, sad, emotional, stay at home, don't want to do anything. 
don't want to dancing or create because they said like uh, nothing more can can uh, can create or can show and on the same time some of them they change their job honestly <laughs> they uh, they become a seller online or they uh, try to find another job that uh, can uh, support them to survive beside or dancing or artist so yeah it, it's hard to to control or to talking about that but uh, for me as a, a artist one artist uh, that I, I can do is uh, try to keep myself more active to research and then to practice and on the same time uh, we try to uh, to to spread the yeah like David said to spread the love or the warmth that uh, everything gonna be fine and gonna be okay so for me as a role role as an artist in uh, Cambodia it's a uh, let's say important and not important because some of them they think uh, art it's it's not really, uh, you know, uh, compared to the the people to survive, money is more important than art because they need to working to find the money. They don't need art. Art for what? And some people said the art just only for the entertainment, you know, singing and uh, dancing. It's uh, nothing. Uh, can survive or they said the uh, art is not a job, not uh, a professional or can find uh, a money. But for me, I try my best to explain to my dancer, also the uh, audience and more and more, a lot of artists, not only dancing, example, the painting, the music or the camera photo, I mean, uh, they start to new create that art, it's also education, art also a job that we can uh, can uh, have money I mean uh, have a salary and not just only entertainment so the role of art is very important uh, for you know for the the, uh, the spirit no for the smart day <laughs> sorry my English it's yeah good. for the mind yeah for the mind you know it's it's really true that and especially I can speak very much for the United States that um, that part of the self that art speaks to, the heart or the spirit or um, that complexity that, that people really do seek because it does exist in the world, we devalue it in the United States very much and it makes it very difficult to be an artist. It's as if we want to cut off that part of, uh, cut out that part of ourselves that makes us really human, you know? Um, and compassionate and empathic to each other. And we devalue it. And that makes it very hard for all of you and for everyone who's trying to make art a life, not just to, for pe other people to see it as a real profession in the best sense of the word, not just about money, but about a purpose for life. Um, so we have just a few more minutes. So I, I wanna ask you each, how do you keep your own creative resilience alive? How do you keep yourselves, uh, uh, how do you keep yourselves in, energized to be creative people? What, what, is the, what is the thing that you need for yourselves and how do you keep it going in your lives? Because that, that's an important lesson for, for everybody to, to value that, keeping that creative part of themselves alive. How, where do you go? What, what, what keeps it, what helps you to do it? So Vivian, wanna start with you? Well, um, I think every person um, has to have a support network. So my support network is my family and I have a five-year-old son. Um, and it's amazing that um, motherhood has really sparked my creative juices um, and nobody ever talks about that. You know, it's <laughs> still quite, uh, a novelty that we have so many women artists now and, and Belle included. It's amazing what you're doing. Um, but for me, having a child really puts things into perspective that you're, it's not about you. It's about um, something greater than you. And really that keeps me humble. It keeps me wanting to work and really wanting to um, 
I don't know, it, it keeps me fresh and young and um, just wanting to contribute and wanting to make the world a better place. It's wonderful. David, what do you, what, how do you keep your spirit going? How do you keep your creative life going? Um, I've actually been really, really blessed that uh, people have been reaching out to me and like wanting to collaborate with me or asking me to write things for them. So yeah, this, this has actually been a busier time than ever for, for, for me because it's uh, been writing music for um, other people and uh, as well as tracking music for them. So I, I've been I've been very fortunate. I also, as uh, Vivian mentioned, the support group is really really important. My family has been very supportive of that, um, and the organizations that I work for also have been really supportive. And I think there's this very huge movement of like people are now much more conscious of what music can do, and so they are also very conscious that we should try and make music not just for uh, commercial purposes, but for you know. Um, for, for, for reasons that you know that, that feed the soul and not just feed the wallet and so I've been privileged to be a part of that so when you see that your music has a positive impact it's like this like virtuous cycle that just gives you a bit more energy to keep going on that's a great answer too yeah. Bill how do you keep how do you keep yourself dancing I think yeah because uh, uh, let's say the passion, passionate that uh, I still uh, fall in love with, uh, with my carry so much, but on the same time, I have a, a motivate from a, a friend as an artist that live in Cambodia. So we always share and then uh, we always uh, talk to each other that uh, we have uh, to keep continue whatever it's uh, in the hard time. And uh, for our method, it's like uh, we will uh, when this situation finishes, we will come back more stronger than before. Well, you, you've all really cheered me up tonight, <laughs> I have to say, you've given me a lot of energy to want to keep writing. Um, and also, I think it's such a tribute to Cambodian Living Arts and to Bang Sokol that it brings all of us together and that there's so, there's so much depth in that piece of work an almost inexhaustible depth of ideas that I think could keep people creating new things for quite a long time with this notion that you can, you can take a collective um, nightmare and turn it into something really amazing and beautiful on the other side decades later. So uh, I thank you. Thank you all very much for being here to talk with us and really grateful. Um, I'm gonna turn this over now to Jean-Baptiste. Um, thank you all. It's great to know you. Be well. Thank you so much, Carol. Thank you so much uh, to the different panelists. It was really uh, an inspiring and refreshing conversation. And uh, we are moving with the festival with the last event that will take place tomorrow. Uh, we will conclude with a live discussion between the organizers, Cameron Living Arts, Arts Emerson, and we will invite Belle back to discuss more about arts healing and the importance of rituals. During this event, you will also be able to interact with the panelists and share your questions. You can go to bangsacall.cameronleadingarts.org to view this event, as well as the full festival program. And you will also find more information about the Arts Healing 2020 Challenge that we invite you to join. Thank you for joining and thank you everybody. Goodbye. Thank you.